Building a full robot just to learn programming fundamentals is a massive time sink. And there's a smarter way to get you and your other programmers up to speed quickly and efficiently. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to create a compact programming test bench packed with common sensors and motors. This setup is going to let you master some of those core programming concepts and rapidly prototype out ideas without needing to build a complete robot. This means your team can iterate faster, build more robust code from day one, and provide a fantastic low-stakes environment for programs to learn and experiment. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been a robotics and technology educator for over a decade. I've coached national champion FTC teams and won multiple Inspire Awards, so I know what it takes to get teams programming efficiently. In this video, I'm going to run you through the components you're going to need, show you how to assemble up the test bench, and then demonstrate some practical examples for both new programmers and seasoned coders looking to quickly test ideas, like stopping a simulated linear slide using magnetic encoders or magnetic limit switches. This board is for any team serious about developing to programmers or for anyone who wants to jump into FTC programming with some confidence. Let's go get started. First thing you're going to need is obviously a 3D printed adapter. I've got a little optional motor wheel here you can put on the end of your motor so you can keep track of where it's rotating. And of course, you've actually got the main 3D print supply. Now, in terms of the parts we're going to be putting on this, we're going to be putting on a standard DC motor. I'm going to be using a Go Build at 12 volt. I'm going to use a positional servo with a standard horn on here. I'm also going to put on a rotational servo with a different horn. We're going to be using a touch sensor. We've also got a color sensor. I'm using version 3, but you could also use version 2. We're using a distance sensor. Or sorry, this is a magnetic limit switch as well as the actual attachment for this Hall Effect sensor. Sorry, the magnet itself. We're also going to be using a distance sensor from Rev. The encoder cable for the back of the Go Build a Motor. And then I've also got a red-green LED indicator here. Let's get started with putting on our control hub. Our control hub, we're going to orientate so that the USB ports are facing away from the prototyping board here. And this is the only unit that requires some M3 hardware. I'm going to put in some three millimeter M3 bolts here so that I can mount this in because unfortunately the control hub requires M3 holes. Everything else is slated up to work with M4. Now these are self-tapping plastic threads because it saves Undine some use some nuts. And quite honestly, this isn't going to have any sort of impacts or vibrations placed upon it. So to get these in, you're going to find you're going to have to push down to get them starting to thread initially. But then once they have caught that first thread, the threads of the machine screw are actually going to make your own threads in the plastic to do a little self-tapping hole. <clears throat> and for parts that don't need a lot of robustness, they're great. Uh, one thing I would recommend is that you don't over tighten these because it is a self-tapping uh, hole and you will end up stripping the plastic threads on that. So let's go ahead and put in our servos. Now for our servos here, I've got one that's positional and one that is continuous. Yes, I know that a lot of these a lot of these servos in FTC robotics are programmable. So why would I bother using one positional and one servo? Uh, well, it does allow you to program both at the same time uh, for one, and you don't need to constantly change it. You don't need to have a servo programming board on your supply board anymore on this prototyping test bench. So that's also nice. It also allows you to program both at the same time. So that's also a nice little benefit of that. So for me, one, one servo horn, I have the positional, or I've, I've got like a 180 bar here to know, denote that that's a positional one. And this one that's in constant rotation allows me to know that this is a 360 degree servo. The plates in the back for the servos here, it doesn't matter what order you put them in. One thing I would recommend you do is make sure you straighten out your cable so you don't get any twists. And then you can feed it through that little hole and we should be able to give it a little bit of flex and it pops in nice and easy. We'll do the same thing with the other servo. Make that pop in nice and easy. 
any standard servo size will fit here. Then there's no need to be using your fancy servos on these either. I'm going to route these cables down the side underneath, and then we're going to use some 8mm M4 hardware to be able to mount these in. Again, using the smallest screw you need for the job, and we're not going to over tighten these because, again, otherwise you will strip those threads out. And there's absolutely no need to be doing that. So again, there's really no forces going through on these things. You want to know how to make these self-tapping holes. For M4 hardware, I find that a 3.9 millimeter hole works wonderfully for self-tapping. And for M3, oh, see, I just over-tightened this, and you can see that I snapped my piece a little bit there. So do not over-tighten these. I got to be watching my bolts as I'm explaining this. But I find that a 3.9 millimeter hole works really well for M4 hardware. There we go. That's as far as I want to go. Beautiful. So we're still good. Let's put in our DC motor. Now when we put in our DC motor here, we're going to... You might. I find that when I print this without supports, it prints just fine. There might be a little bit of stringing back there. Oh, focus in, please. There might be a little bit of stringing back here you got to push back. But it's really not too large of a deal. So if you take your M4, or sorry, your DC motor here, you want to make sure your encoder section is facing up. You want to be facing it down because that's just going to make it a pain to wire later. Have that servo cable underneath our DC motor. Slide that in. Now with a little bit of love, that slides in nicely like so. We're going to go ahead and mount this thing down with a few 20 millimeter bolts. Well, actually, no. I think uh, 12 millimeter bolt to fit just fine on that. So we got four 12 millimeter bolts to hold that DC motor in. Might be some 18. Now these holes are not self tapping on the DC motor. So for these holes, I find that a 4.3 millimeter hole works great for holding in, or works great as a through hole for pieces that you don't have any resistance on them. There you go. So my DC motor is nice and secure in there. I've got this little motor wheel you can use. You don't have to, but I do find it's got a little knob on here or a little notch that lets you know where that DC motor is in its place. That just slides on. We'll use a little six millimeter screw to hold that in because the bottom of these eight millimeter axled go build the motors allow for that. There we go. So our setup's coming together. Let's keep on going. Let's move the wires out of the way for now. Now for our four sensors, we've got our color sensor, our distance sensor, our magnetic limit switch, and our touch sensor. I like to put the color sensor and the touch sensor or the color sensor and distance sensor on the far outside points and then the touch sensor on this one and the magnetic limit switch on this one because I've got this little extra daughter board or this little extra hole right here and what this little hole is for is to put in a little short stubby screw like anywhere from four to six mil and then you can store your magnetic limit switch magnet on there so you're not going to lose it. Uh, but you cannot put your magnetic limit switch here because if you do put it here, you're very close. It's about five millimeters away from this to be able to register as true or false. Uh, and uh, I'm not a big fan. Well, you don't want to be sending off some readings when you're trying to program these things. Get frustrated. So let's put our touch sensor on instead. I'm going to orientate all of my cables so that all of the cable ports are facing to the right. And let's go ahead and secure this in. There we go. We got our touch sensor. Good to go. I'm going to put my magnetic limit switch on the next point.
Now at this point, you might be wondering, why do I have all these little holes in the bottom of these points? The reason I do that is simply just to save on some plastic. Because these parts are going to be bolted in to this place, there's no need for you to have a perfectly flat surface all the way at the top, or to have that same thickness of this test bench all the way across, because you're going to be having a lot of added rigidity on your test bench from all of these parts being added on and bolted down. So giving it a little extra that space is pretty huge. Now, I know this seems like it's going to be a lot of work to put this all together, but it will take you maybe 10 minutes to put this whole thing together, if that. And once you've got that whole thing together, now you've got a great programming board to use for at least a few seasons to come. And then after that, those first few seasons, you're likely, once we switch over to a new control manual, you're likely going to... Oh, come on. Once we switch over to a new control system, you're going to find that the likely the only thing you're going to have to trade out on this is your... Oh, this is going to be a bright pain. Okay. Now, this LED daughter board will accept M4 hardware, but you might need to work your threads a little bit to be able to get this LED indicator in, because you're not going to want to snap this board. Okay, there we are. So let's get around to actually wiring this up. Now, most of these take these little four pin JST connectors. They wire up as exactly the same as you, any sort of standard work here. The other servo here, I'm just simply gonna choose ports zero and port one. And for the cable management, we can actually just kind of push that underneath the servo. Make sure that, or sorry, not underneath the servo, underneath the DC motor. Make sure that when you're putting these things in, that you are making sure that your signal, your power, and your ground are all going to the correct sizes. For our DC motor, because I'm using these Go Buildas, I'm gonna need this bullet connector over to a, I actually can't remember what type of these connectors are called. It's not a connector I use very frequently. Some sort of large JST connector. We'll go ahead and plug that into our zero port there. We're gonna cable manage that in a minute. Then we also need our a motor encoder off of that. So for the motor encoders on Gabilda, you actually need a, a larger JST connector down to a smaller JST. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, put that into our motor encoder. And then this wires in to our encoder section of our motor. So make sure you plug it into the correct port. These JST connectors are also only one way. So they only will connect in one way as well. So we'll just route that around there for now, and we will get to cable manage thing in a bit. You can also use a lot shorter cables as a way of helping you uh, control some of this <laughs> nastiness. Let's go ahead and plug in our little LED indicator now. Yep. And our LED indicator goes into one of our digital ports. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this into digital zero for now. Let's grab our color sensor. Sorry, this is our distance sensor. And our distance sensor goes into an I2C port. Plug in our touch sensor. Touch sensor goes into a digital port. I'm gonna do up our magnet limit switch. Now, for whatever reason, this one's actually wired up backwards. Uh, this one also goes into the digital port. And then the last one is our color sensor. This one also is backwards from these two sensors. And then this one goes into the IT2C port as well. Okay. So we're almost done here. The last thing we need to do is do a little bit of 
cable management. Now I've got this little hoop in the bottom of the board here, and this allows you to grab the I2C cables up and out of the way. So the intention behind this design is to grab these, work them beside the other sensors and cables, and then you can grab them, run that little zip tie through that bottom point and sometimes it could be hard to get around, so I take a little fold on that zip tie, and that allows me to more easily grab it once we force it through on the other side. There we go. Just make sure you've wrapped it around all four cables. We're just going to get this somewhat started for now. You don't want to strain these cables too much. This will help make things look a little bit more clear. We will just work that through to get these cables up and out of the way so that you can easily access your sensors. We'll grab another cable tie so we can actually get rid of this last little bundle here, make it look a little bit neater. It's always good to be cable managing your parts so that you don't have things running in and out of the way. Again, just make sure you're not tightening these things down so much that you put any strain on your cable connections. Just like on your robot, you don't want your robot having those strain on those connections. You also don't want strain on these connections for these points either. Let's go ahead and do the DC motor and its odometry cable out here so we can get that out of the way as well. And for this one, honestly, a little cable tie just wrapped around like so will probably be just fine for our purposes. So let's hoop this up and under. This one's not perfectly managed. Not a big deal, because we can still access everything. And the important things, like being able to see all of our sensors, are all out of the way. There we go. Okay. We'll grab some flush cutters here as a way of cutting off those last little cables. And at this point, your prototyping board is done. When you're ready to connect this, all you're going to need to do, obviously, is get in your USB cables or a Wi-Fi, and then connect it with a 12-volt power supply. Uh, you can get a, a benchtop one, or you could just grab yourself one of your standard batteries for getting this set up. So I hope you found that helpful. Uh, keep an eye out for future program tutorials here. Uh, I'll have some links down in the comments down below. And best of luck on building your robot and getting yourself uh, up to snuff quickly using some programming boards with some common sensors.